Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to my YouTube video channel. I'm so excited to have two of my college, uh, uh, my mentor and my friend to be in this channel today. And I, I am invited Dr. Berger, Ivan Berger, my mentor and uh, my college friend, uh, partner, uh, Dr. Charles Dury in uh, this channel today. We have a really nice day that I have some time to talk with them before we started. Uh, conversation uh, just to be more like introduce Dr. Berger, who he see is how you know how he's been with dentistry more than fifty years, and it's an honor to have him here. Dr. Ivan Berger, welcome here. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Luck. I have to say, but that Dr. Luck um, was really an outstanding uh, young dentist uh, when I was still. Uh, uh, one of the dental directors at uh, one of the uh, dental companies uh, here in uh, California, Southern California. He was an outstanding dentist. Uh, he bailed me out a couple times when uh, some of the other dentists <laughs> didn't quite do what they needed to do. So I always call him Dr. Locke. I said, Dr. Locke, I really needed extra help. Can you help me do <laughs> this here? And I remember one case where he did uh, several crowns over. It was really a very difficult uh, patient uh, and he did an outstanding job. So I have to really thank him again for all his help. Beautiful. Okay, so anyway, I was uh, born in Washington, D.C. Um, we, after the uh, World War II, the, the big WW2, um, my dad uh, got a new car, and uh, I, well, there was uh, four, it was, had three brothers, uh, so I made four, there were four boys, packed us into the new car, and uh, we took a vacation to California, we, we fell in love with it, and in 1949, uh, we moved permanently here to California. Um, Spent the rest of the time in Encino, California, in the San Fernando Valley. Um, went to UCLA undergraduate school. Um, in between the, the first year, uh, the Korean War broke out, and so I had to be. I was in the Air National Guard. Got activated uh, for about 15, 15, 16 months. Was sent overseas to Japan. Came back, finished up at UCLA. Um, then uh, had a, I made application to about three or four different dental schools, got in at NYU, I uh, had never been to New York, so I figured I'd go there and see the Big Apple and uh, graduated from NYU. I was lucky in my third year, met my beautiful wife uh, on a blind date, brought her back to California, uh, practiced in Simi Valley, California, um, which unfortunately had some no notoriety uh, today. Um, We'll go past that um, and uh, practice in Simi Valley uh, from about 1961 on um, my, let's see, the 1961, it probably is about, let's see, I got something on the wall here, uh, retired, oh yeah, I got my handpiece, <laughs> an old Midwest handpiece, uh, a straight handpiece with uh, the old belt driven, it says July 1992, so wow. that's when I packed it up. Uh, my son um, went to uh, dental school, uh, Herschel, uh, up at uh, up at UOP, and uh, he joined the practice. And after a couple of years, I said, okay, I had enough. I bailed out, and he took over the practice with his wife. Uh, she also was a UOP grad. Uh, since then, I went, was in actually retirement, and I was got really bored not doing anything. And I was looking around, looking around. And I was looking in the uh, wanted ads in the newspaper. Don't ask me why you're there, but I saw an ad that said uh, that someone wanted to do a um, review of dental offices uh, for a dental company. And <clears throat> so I went down, that was in Laguna Nigel. The company was called uh, Denny Care. And that was one, really one of the first HMO uh, programs uh, in Southern California. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I uh, interviewed, and uh, the person that interviewed me was uh, Paul Manis, and uh, Dr. Manis was the uh, dental director at the time, but he wanted to do something different. And uh, so I did an interview as a, uh, uh, to, to be, become an auditor uh, for one of the dental offices, so that the, their dental offices. And then he called me up a couple of days later, and he said, uh, Dr. Berger, he says, um, you're overqualified. Uh, because I had a lot of experiences with uh, uh, previous with HMO companies. And he said, would you like to be dental director? And I said, well, you know, what's a dental director do? And he said, well, you, you come down here, we'll talk to you about it. And I said, well, how many days is that? He says, five days. I said, I only work in now three days. Why would I work five days? He says, come down. 
So I went down. I, when I went down, I told, before I went down, I told my wife, I said, look, if I'm going to do an interview. I'm not going to waste my time and his time. I'm going to do a good interview. Like, I really want the job, but if we get it, then we have to move to Laguna Nigel. So she says, go ahead and do your interview. Went down, did the interview. They called me up a couple of days later and said, gee, we think we want you to be our dental director. And that's the beginning of my second career as a dental director. It was with Denny Care. Um, my, the CEO at that time, it was with Foundation Health. I don't know if you can remember that, but Foundation Health um, was a large uh, medical HMO up in the Sacramento area. And the CEO was uh, Dan Crowley. Uh, and um, he built that company from just a, just a few places up to a huge, huge company. Um, and later it became Foundation Health. And so he purchased this small dental company because they wanted to have a dental company. And uh, that was Denny Care. And that's how I became first time become a dental director. And from there, I, um, after Denny Care was sold, um, went to another company called uh, Smile Care, and um, then went to another company called Coast Dental. And then uh, I was ready to finally retire. And uh, Dan Crowley called me up one day and he said, uh, Would I like to come over and work with him? He had just been come, he just be, was his name CEO of this other company, this new company called uh, Western Dental Services. And I said, okay, I would come over to Western Dental. And I worked there for about, let's see, probably about five, six years. And then finally, uh, when COVID came around, um, they start uh, putting people on temporary status. And I read the headlines. I, I was able to read between the lines of the letter they sent out. What they really were saying is, look, we're going to down, down, uh, download uh, <laughs> the people there. So I said, okay, that was it. So that's how I finally uh, retired. And uh, Western Dental is still a very large company. Uh, they've, they've purchased uh, many offices uh, in the Midwest just a couple of days ago, I understand. So that was, the, that was my life history, my biography. It's beautiful, oh, Dr. Berger. I just how many, to... uh, sorry, how many, how many offices was the original uh, first uh, group practice organization that you joined? How many offices were they? When you uh, probably Western, that would be the most recent, well, now, going most back to the first had, one, most of them the had to be at least 100 one. offices, between 50 to 75 offices. You know, and, but Western Dental was a very, very large organization, and they've built it up now to a, to really to a super large uh, dental. It's no longer called HMO. It's really they call it dental service organizations. Um, Western Dental is a little different than like from uh, uh, some of the other ones, I think like Heartland or some of the others that actually have a, more of a franchise type of operation where they're, Mm -hmm. uh, the dentists can either own Actual. part of the practice or something like that, and the uh, and the parent company uh, supplies all the backup um, um, employment inform information uh, support, and the dentist is only responsible for treating the patients, but participates uh, in part of the profits of the uh, the office. So, uh, Western Dental is strictly just uh, for dentists that want to join the company and uh, become employees. So I do, I do a lot of innovation. I do a lot of creation of things and, and thought leadership and things of like that. And I'm really curious as to when you first started in practice, okay. you know, the things that came out that were revolutionary, that changed dentistry. Can you mention to me some of those things and how you adopted them and how that went? Like can you, when you come out, when you think back, I mean, it could be little things, right? But, yes, but but can you remember some of the things that were pinnacle things? Yes, yes that, I still some what? of the things. Yeah, some of the things still stick out in my mind. Uh, when I opened practice in Simi Valley, it was a semi-rural area. Uh, it's uh, for those that, that may not be familiar with uh, Simi Valley. Or Simi Valley. It's a, probably about yeah. ten miles west of, of um, uh, north and west of uh, of of, the, of San Fernando Valley. So it was a very young. A community that was just starting to uh, grow, and they were building large tracts of uh, probably not low income, but somewhat middle to low income uh, tracts, like you know maybe six hundred, a thousand homes. So it was really burgeoning, uh, exploding. So we went there just in the very beginning. Um, my brother and I. My brother also uh, went as a dentist. He was up at uh, graduated of UC uh, up in San Francisco. And uh, when we started out, it's like 
there was no really support in there. So we had, to, we were young dentists. We really had to learn how to do a lot of things ourselves, how to do extractions, uh, how to do a little bit more complicated extractions. Uh, we took a course, my brother and I, uh, over at Loma Linda, I believe it was Loma Linda, and I can't, Jurgensen, that's who it was, Jurgensen. And he had this IV sedation program. And so we took that program and it was a very specific program uh, on light sedation. So you really didn't get into any deep sites, uh, deep sedation, as long as you followed his, uh, his guidelines. And we went there, I think it was probably about two months or three months or something, we took that course. So it was really a great course to get started and also it helped uh, build the practice. Um, as the practice grew uh, in the uh, 60s and 70s, um, we moved into, uh, remember we moved into another office, larger office, and I wanted to make our patients uh, have, you know, be more relaxed. I thought to myself, well, you know, that was the time of VHS uh, tapes. And so I had a VH, uh, VHS player and I had headphones and I would give it to the uh, patients uh, and I had like a bunch of tapes and if they wanted to bring their own VHS tapes to listen to music uh, they could do that so that was very uh, innovative we did that and that was really something really good um, also I went over at uh, that time to I used to go take a lot of courses over at USC and um, I can't think of the, the gentleman's name. He was in the Perio department. Probably your dad knows him at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did a course for some GP, uh, GPs that wanted to do a little bit, learned a little bit more about perio surgery, some of the basic perio surgeries, how to lay a flap, how to close a flap, how mm -hmm. to do some minor gingivectomies at that time that we, they were doing, or even uh, uh, open osseous uh, surgery. Nothing too great. In other words, not full mouth uh, uh, osseous surgery. So we took that, I took that course over there. It was a very good study club. So I took several study clubs over at USC. Um, Alex Coper uh, was there and he gave a course also on uh, Crown and Bridge. I took that course. So I was always learning, always wanted to take more and more courses and learn more. I was just like, I just wanted to always expand my ability uh, to be able to do dentistry. So those are some of the innovative things. Uh, I missed out on uh, now what you people are doing uh, with uh, scanning uh, Digital, uh, for yeah. yep, scanning for impressions instead of uh, doing the, uh, the, uh, the the silicone or the rubber base impressions. That we, actually, I started out with uh, hydro hydrocolloid. Yeah, result, uh, man, yeah. yeah. If you really want to know, in dental school, we were taking copper band impressions. Okay, you mm. probably haven't even don't don't even know what that's mm. about. Where you take a copper band. You would anneal it with uh, under a flame, uh, so it lost its uh, metal. It was a really soft, <laughs> and wow. you would trim it to the contours of the tooth, and then you would uh, put the warm compound in it and take wow. an impression. And then they wow. would um, you would have to put it in a bath or something to uh, make an anodyne, make a dye out of it. And then you would pour it up and uh, make a. That's how you made your stone model. Okay, that was like really prehistoric uh, uh, history in dentistry. So anyway, um, I said, you know, that was really, a, that's really a messy thing. So I got into hydrocolloid. I loved hydrocolloid. Uh, when that went away, then rubber base impressions. But today you guys are really fantastic what you can do with uh, scanning techniques. And uh, then you can take it and uh, make a file out of it from what I understand and send it to your lab and you're by, by, by electronics. And then the lab can uh, take this, this file and create a, a digital model. And uh, from that, they can uh, make a die and uh, and uh, do the computer generated uh, crown, um, ceramic crown and send it back to you and get the whole thing done. Probably if you work with the right lab, maybe what, three or four days or something like that. And uh, the patient doesn't have to wear a temporary crown. I don't know today, uh, you know, making temporary crowns, we used to make them and the patients were always losing the temporary crowns and it always happened on a yeah. weekend and you had to go in and make sure. them feel comfortable. And you know, it was like, a, that was like really, that was really a down part. So I think today it's really fantastic. I think cone beam uh, radiography is really fantastic. Um, I mean, like, uh, it's just great. I go, we have a very good friend up in the, uh, Irvine, who's an endodontist and uh, he's done a couple of root canals, you know, as you get older, it's not that you don't take care of your teeth, it's just that the 
the, the, the pulpal tissue says, you know, I've had enough pounding and I <laughs> give up. OK, you yeah. know, you beat me up for for 60 years, 70 years, 80 years. And uh, I had enough. <laughs> I start screaming in the middle of the night. So he's done some fantastic work and he's got a, a cone beam up there and uh, you'll be able to see sagittal sections. And it's a really fantastic uh, thing. Amazing. It's an amazing. It's amazing. It's it's a, amazing. I guess, the ne yeah, the next thing will probably be robotic surgery. I don't know how that's already here. Yeah, that's, that's already, already here. here. Yeah. yeah. And uh, digital uh, denture making and uh, too, fabrication. Yeah. Yep. I mean, In-house. In-house fabrication. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, it's a whole new world. Uh, for you young guys out there. So, you know, God bless you. <laughs> yeah, real, real, real time solutions like crown manufacturing. I did my own crown manufacturing and everything in house, you know, and so uh, you even get you even get a tax and research credit uh, for manufacturing uh, from the from the government. <laughs> so there's, there's some advantages to some of this technology, right? Right. But, uh, you know, incentives. So for, for those of you just joining and watching our show today, uh, the reason I, br I brought Dr. Berger in is because Dr. Berger has been in, in dentistry for a number of years. And uh, before we, the, we speak, he allowed me to share with you guys that Dr. Berger uh, had just retired just a couple of years ago. Uh, and But he would work in until he is uh, at the age of 89 or 90. So 91. 91. I just made 91 in this right. May. Happy, yes, happy birthday, yeah. Dr. Berger. So you, you. Uh, the reason uh, uh, I bring the Dr. Berger in because he has a lot of knowledge, not only in dentistry, but leadership and uh, corporate world and everything. So um, I want to ask Dr. Berger a very some simple question about education. You know, Dr. Berger, you uh, obtained the highest uh, uh, Academy of General Dentistry, which is a master degree. And do you feel for the young uh, uh, student, uh, should they obtain that uh, and, um, you know, or other fellowship? Uh, would you give them a little bit of, um, you know, encouragement about that? Absolutely. Part? You know, <clears throat> when I was in dental school, okay, I started dental school in 54, 1954. So that's before you guys were probably born. I know that. We were not and, born yet. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> you weren't even an idea in your parents' mind right. at that time. Yes. But uh, I remember the first day uh, when the, I had a large class of students, okay? This is the NYU Dental School, College of Dentistry. And we had this really handsome dean who was as ramrod straight, tall, spoke with a beautiful Bostonian accent. He was a prosthodontist from Boston, from, uh, from Boston who became dean at the school. And he's, the one thing I still remember is he says, they can take everything away from you but the one thing they cannot take away from you, anyone can take away from you, is your dental education. That no one can ever take away from you. And he says, you always have to be a student. And that really has uh, been my really guiding light is yeah. that you always have to be a student. You, you never sure. say, you never say, I know what, what has to be done, or you, know, you need to go to the next level. You always need to keep active. And I think that's one of the reasons uh, that I still enjoy dentistry. If I might for a second, Cyril, just come in and say hello. Okay, here's my mentor. Okay, okay, she may not look too great. So just come in and just say hello, real fast. Just or just wave. How many? How many years, Ivan? Uh, sixty-five, right, Cy? Sixty-five. Sixty-five. Okay, you're gonna come in and say hello real fast or not? No, she has to work. She doesn't. She's not as fast as as we used to be. Anyway, she's been the love of my life for sixty five years, and uh, she keeps after me. And if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here today. And I really mean that. Um, but I would say for students, uh, keep learning. Just really keep learning. And if I could say something, um, I was going to say something about you know young dentists coming out of school. You know what 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 are their options? Uh, if you, I don't know if you want to talk anything about that or yes, please, yes, yes, please talk talk about that, Doctor Berger. Well, you know, their option because the young dentists come out with uh, burden of uh, you know. Um, okay, here's yeah. the story. Here's yeah. the here's the real story. Okay, yeah. you got four years of undergraduate study. Okay, that's going to cost anywhere from depending whether it's a state school or private school. And I'm certain Dr. Drury can, can, can attest to that as well as you can, Dr. Locke. 
anywhere from seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars more, depending if you went to a private uh, university, just for undergraduate. Then you got four years in dental school today. From what I understand, that can cost anywhere. Whether it's it, it depends if it's a private, uh, whether excuse me, whether it's a public dental school such as uh, Sunny uh, or some of the other state dental schools in the country, can cost anywhere from a hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollars, or you can go up to three or four hundred thousand dollars. Depend. And then if you want to go into a specialty, you got additional costs. There's a huge, huge burden that uh, young uh, dentist uh, coming out. So if for a general dentist, I would say there are two options. One, you could go in as an associate. There's, it's going to be very difficult to open your own practice because you've got this huge debt service from your education. Then you're going to go to the bank and the bank is going to say, you know, what, are your, what is your backing? What is your, unless you've got a parent that's a multi, multi-millionaire that can say, you know, I'll just put your, I'll just open your office. So it's very difficult to open your own office. So either you're going to go into some type of an association, associate re relationship, or you can go into one of the large dental group services, such as Western Dental or Aspen or Heartland or something like that. You'd have to be really careful which ones you want to go and investigate that. But that's a great opportunity because starting from day one, you can earn an income. Second advantage of it is, is that uh, you're going to learn how to develop your speed. Uh, if you really want to be interested, you can watch how finances are done. So, you, so it's a good way for at least a year, a couple of years to get to learn a little bit more about dentistry, to develop your skills, develop your interpersonal relationships uh, with patients, to see how an office is run. So it's a, really, it's a great way to learn. Uh, also, uh, if you want a, thir a third option would be uh, you could go in, if you want to reduce your debt, you could go into a uh, one of the government type of uh, Military health service, or, yeah, you know, health service yeah. uh, 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 offices they have, uh, community health services, and you can uh, you agree to work for so many years, uh, and they reduce your debt that way. I think another way that if I was going to do it today, I would to go into the military because right, I right. know from experience that if you're in dental school uh, and you join to you agree to a, a contract. Uh, they will they will provide you with income while you're while you're going to dental school. Uh, when you complete your dental education, you go in as what as a second lieutenant. No, as a first lieutenant today. Uh, you have a great opportunity to develop your skills. You got a lot of great mentors there. Um, get a chance to earn a decent income, and then if you really are interested. Uh, and you agree to sign up for another con another contract to go into one of their specialty training centers, and you can get a, a you know periodontal, uh, right. a full uh, a prosthodontist, any one of those uh, oral surgery, and you get a recognized certificate. So you got a certificate. So you get that, but you know you spend a long time doing that. You have to start, sign up for these service. They're not going to let you just do it and, and leave. But it's a great opportunity, and you can get a great uh, promotions. And if you really like the work, you can stay for what, 20 years and then you can retire. You're still a young person and you've got a pension, et cetera, like that. And uh, you go out and practice. So it's, it, there's a lot of opportunities out there today. Um, the one thing I would caution, and I, I've seen this happen before, if you go, if a young dentist goes into a, re, a relationship um, as a, uh, uh, with a older or, or more, I shouldn't say older, more mature to a general dentist, you really have to define before you actually start what you want to do. Uh, you need to find out a little bit more about the practice. You need to find out a little bit more about the uh, the dentist, and you agree to say, "Okay, look, let's let's enter into an informal relation." You spell it out a little bit if you even were to uh, have a, a little written document, which wouldn't be bad. And then after six months, go into a, a decide whether you want to go whether you want to stay with that practice or whether that dentist will take you in on some type of permanent uh, ownership. Um, I think today, dentists used to retire at 65, bingo, you were out of there, that was enough, everybody had to retire. That was that was the way it was and when I practiced, 65 years, that was it, you had enough, you had 30 years, um, you get a little burnt out, you get a little tired, so 65 years, you, you retired. Today, you've got dentists out there that are working well into their close to 80 or more, uh, that it still do that. So I'm afraid that if you don't have a more definite relationship spelled out, 
with the uh, dentist uh, that <clears throat> that brought you into the practice, he could say at age 80 or age 75, excuse me, I don't want you anymore. I've got a son that's just ready to get out of dental school and, and goodbye. So you have to be really careful today. It doesn't mean you shouldn't go into that type of, I, I would encourage that type of relation, but be very, very specific on how that will go after six months. That's all I'm saying. And have some, and when, when you get to the six month, then it has to be a formal relationship, whether you want to stay or whether he's going to bring you or she is going to bring you into the practice. I shouldn't keep saying he, it should be today, she. Would you? Because I think over 50% of the students today in dental school are uh, of the uh, are, are, are females. Yeah. Would, would you say that given, let's go back in time. Let's think about your experience over the time when you started until you got more mature, right? Okay. And you, le you learn. And my question is for you, I had a mentor that kind of taught me to do it a certain direction. And you talked about going into DSOs and gaining space and gaining speed, which you do, you gain speed, right? But the question, I have, well, the question I have for you is, do you believe that when you're learning and this process that we go through and how we understand and we build our minds and we build our skill set and we know our knowledge base increases as we practice and we mature, we learn certain things, um, do you believe that uh, you should go for speed or should you go for quality and, and repetition over time that will generate into quality results that will be long? Because I was told by my mentor that you know, don't go as fast, do quality, repeat that quality, and over time you will become faster. Or do you, That's think, very you, true. Or do you think you should go straight into the speed and just go and... No, and, no, no. I think quality, think quality always... Quality rules, okay? Quality right. rules. Okay, yeah, there's no question. When I say speed... You know, when you're young, <laughs> you're really young yes. and you've got a patient that's 50, 60 years old in your chair and you're kind of like, you know, just slowly going around and you're looking for the handpiece and looking for the right burr and you put the burr in and you take the burr out. And, you know, you're doing that kind of a thing like in, like in indecis indecision, uh, indecision. Indecisive, yes. Yeah, yeah. Bit, so yeah. I think that that's where I'm talking about increasing your speed. Uh, okay, wait. Okay, just say hello, Sire. This is this is the one that kept me going for 65 years. Who am I talking to? Wait, okay, hello. 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 okay, you're hello. recorded. Hello. Okay, you're, you're talking to the doctor okay. with the golden hands. <laughs> okay, goodbye. <laughs> that's right. first. Bye. I'm second. Okay. Bye. Nice goodbye. to meet you. That's the one that kept me hello. going. Good to see you, sir. I haven't yes, seen you for a long, long time. At least uh, right. close to 20 years. God, is it that long? Yes. I can't believe it. It goes too I'm fast, everything. I'm dry. You guys still look young. Oh, well, he's doing terrific. <laughs> okay, you keep it close. They think I'm 101. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Taking care of him, okay. I become 101. I knew right. I was going to be Bye. I'm Goodbye. a New Yorker. I okay. never get off the telephone. Please. I <laughs> say <laughs> bye-bye. Okay, bye -bye. Nice bye -bye. okay sweetheart. Bye-bye. Okay. Met her on a blind date. I knew she was going to marry her. My cousin. She had a boyfriend, but I said that it didn't bother me. <laughs> didn't buy, you bypassed that, yes. But anyway, quality always supersedes uh, oh, speed. Yeah. Yeah, speed doesn't mean, you know, like, so anyway, that, that's what I'm trying to say that, you know, you develop the, 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 a little bit confidence in what you're doing because an older patient uh, will pick up on that uh, today and say, oh, well, <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Berger, but, uh, you know, and in the mind, but they'll, they'll go home and they'll say, okay, I'm going to go somewhere else. So um, I think another, I, I don't know, I would really recommend, um, there's a um, dental study club today I belong to, it's called I Love Dentistry. And uh, Dr. Marshak, you know, you, you your dad should know Marshak over at uh, USC, there's the son, the father and the son, uh, both the uh, prosthodontists, um, and they started this uh, I Love Dentistry Study Club. And uh, once a month, uh, they have a speaker, and then about once every month and a half, uh, we have another speaker. And then uh, for the first hour, and then the second hour, uh, they break off into various study groups, and uh, we discuss what was done, and and you know, have actually communication. Study clubs are the, one of the greatest ways I learned about dentistry. I think that without hands, sure, with hands-on study Even. clubs are fantastic. I, I mean, if you can get into a good study club, some of the specialists will actually sponsor study clubs with a group of a dentist in their area. Incredible! I would, I, I would recommend that. Even recommend during that. the breaks, the peer-to-peer -peer interaction of of communicating, you pick up a little tip, you talk about, hey, you know, what do you do in this situation, or how do you do that, right? And you pick up these little pearls from each other, right? Yeah, absolutely. Camaraderie, you know, and and uh, you know, most dentists are on an island, 
right? So yep. unless you're in a big group, right? You don't get you're the right. luxury of being able to talk with one another. And um, and it's powerful to be able to share uh, lessons and experiences and wisdom, right? Oh, let me um, tell you something. The greatest, I shouldn't say about, I don't mean it as a positive, but the greatest, the, the most important teaching uh, tool that, 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 that I experienced was you learn by your mistakes, okay? And I think that's really true. The issue is you don't want to make the same mistake twice, but so you right. have to learn from that mistake. And when you learn from that, that's how you mature. Okay. Right. You know, uh, if you always want to be timid, you're always going to be that, that's the type of practice you're going to have. You're going to have that. But if you want to try and expand a little bit, there are going to be, you know, you have to have education, you have to study clubs, whatever it is, but you have to be willing to take that little bit to the next level. And then yeah. you start to learn, you go baby steps, you start to learn that way. And uh, you will have some mistakes, but you will grow from those mistakes. And so that you don't repeat those mistakes, you'll be able to see, okay, is this the way I really want to treat that particular type of uh, uh, treatment plan? Or is that like beyond me, I need to pass it over to the periodontist, those kind of things. So and, and I think you learn by, I think you learn, really learn by w what didn't work. Not oh, not correct. mistakes, not not willful mistakes. You didn't go out to willfully hurt somebody, but but it didn't work out the way you wanted it or the way you thought it would work out, and that's how you learn. Absolutely, and it's it's interesting because sometimes you know we make mistakes and we are so hard on ourselves that sometimes we take that mistake and we'll say, "I'm never going to do that again." That's right. And, and and unfortunately, sometimes I believe that that's actually a negative because there are some mistakes you do, and perhaps it would have been still a good technique. But you pre you have a preconceived notion not to try anymore because you say I'm not going to do it that way. So we we're a creature of our own habits of how we learn, right? And so sometimes that's, some of these things, you know, it's like it's just that you need to try it three or four times to get the technique down. That's so you right. Gotta, you know, force yourself to say it didn't work out that time, but it may still be valid. It may still be valid. You know, it's, it's like the hardest part. Especially it's like you fall off a horse. You fall off a horse. You got to get back on it again. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's that that's what it is that's what it is and then it becomes sub subconscious right at some point in time whatever how you do it so many times now you're you're, you're prepping and then you you've done that before you prep and you go wait how did it get to this point you know it's like it's so it's so unconscious right Sometimes. it's it's unconscious correct okay you, you, have, no. you have the ability you have the before you start when you're when you've done this you've gained the confidence because you know what's going to work and what's not going to work you know before you start how that prepper how that tooth is going to look when you prepare it you know mentally exactly envision it. Mentally you know envision exactly it. you know exactly in your mind and, and, and you don't even think about it your hand and your, 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 your seems to take over and it does exactly what you want it to do in your mind you can you can actually see it in your mind how you want that tooth to be prepared. my my analogy to that is playing pool or billiards i don't know if you've ever played pool or billiards but when you play pool or billiards when you do when you're really good at it you actually, when you're, you're tuning up for the ball and you're going to the pocket, you actually mentally envision that ball going in the pocket before you hit it. That's yep. when you get really successful, right? right. If Correct. you think about it and you worry about it, then the ball's not going in the pocket. But if you that's actually envision that, mentally projecting it, and I think that that's a big thing. I think that mentally projecting positive outcomes in yes. our clinical dentistry is is huge. Yes. To get to that unconscious bridge. Yes. Don't be afraid. Okay, uh, but that doesn't mean you should be. It's not the wild west. Okay, I don't mean to use that type of a wild uh, type of analogy, but you need you need to feel that you can do it. And I'll tell you that here's the here's the the the, the collateral uh, to if something didn't work out. If you can if you have a really great relationship with your patient, right? They will always say, "Gee, you know, you don't say, gee, I made a mistake,' but gee, it didn't work out, uh, Mr. Smith, the way it would do it, uh, the way we did it." They'll say, okay, doc, I understand not to worry about it. So what can we do? Say, okay, look, we'll do plan B uh, for the tooth. And, you know, yeah. you don't have to charge the patient for that. Okay. Because we got another one. We got another one. We could share the other one. <laughs> right. Dr. Berger, I, my, my favorite is my favorite is when you're working on someone and then you say, and I heard this from another dentist that used it, but I used it on my patients later just to joke around is you say you're working, you're real quiet. And then you say, damn. And you be real yeah. quiet, and then you and you pause, and they look at you with the face like this. Yeah. And you say, "Damn, I'm good." Yeah, there you go. You got it. <laughs> right. That's very good. Excellent. Very good. What, what would you say is the biggest 
and your intera interactions with patients is huge. Connections with patients are huge, right? You yes. talked about that, right? It's, it's a huge fundamental thing. So in all your years of practicing, how did you relate to your patients and connect to them on a deep level? I mean, that was probably the key. That's the key to treatment acceptance. That's the key to uh, trust. That's the key to relationships and comfort and everything else. So what do you think are some of the things that you learned as a dentist that made you connect with patients over time that you became proficient at? Not from the beginning, but you know, as you've matured, right? I would sit down and talk with the patient and develop that interpersonal relationship. Not, not, I didn't want to be their buddy. I didn't want to be their friend. I wanted them to have trust in me. And that when I told them, you know, what we we're going to do, that this would be in their best interest. So I, so in other words, if a patient came in for the first time and they had a broken tooth, um, I wouldn't try to say at that time, we're going to do everything else in the world. Take care of their immediate problem. Solve their immediate problem. Once you solve their immediate problem yeah. and you talk with them, uh, then they're going to develop confidence in you. And so that you can go to, to the patient, bring them back to the next next visit or so to see how they're doing and then tell them, you know, well, maybe we need to do a little bit more for some of the rest of your teeth so we don't have to go through this emergency again and save you uh, that problem. So I think that, that that's really important. I think another um, another thing that really worked well with per, uh, personal relationship is always if you had a if you had a difficult pay and I've you probably heard this submit, said many times if you had a difficult um, uh, surgery or, or or crown prep it took longer much longer than you thought and they may have some uh, discomfort afterwards give them a call at night and just see how you're feeling that's Absolutely. all to say hey you know how are you doing today how, how are you doing? is everything okay. Okay, good. Look, I want to call. If you have any problems, it's like on a Friday you did it. If you have any problems over the weekend, give me a call. The many a times uh, that I went in on a weekend uh, to help a patient out for an emergency, I was always available. And um, my uh, my old my youngest son uh, is a physician. He's a endo he's a endocrinologist up in Santa Barbara. And he said, he, he said, gee, Dad, I remember a lot of times we were going to go do something on the weekend and you had to go into the office and that, uh, but that was it. That was it. So I think, but you know, an interesting thing that you've said today, or I've heard today, <clears throat> the millennial young people today are much different than when I was starting out. Work, uh, dentistry was always like, that was that was it. Okay, today they want a little bit. They want a different lifestyle, and they they want to have sure. also a personal life, a balance, a more balanced life, a personal life as well as for the professional life. So you know maybe they only want to work three days a week. Uh, they don't want to work five days a week. So I think that's a there's a lot of that uh, under underscore that's going on today. That's going to be a different type of practitioner. Uh, going forward than you see today, like you, Dr. Dury, or like Dr. Locke, uh, or certainly like uh, I am. I'm not a dinosaur, but it was. It's a different. It's a different world out there today. And they also want to diversify and do other things besides dentistry too. They yes, that's do, what I'm saying. They want to buy companies. They want to start companies outside of dentistry. They want yeah. to, you know, like. Uh, <laughs> well, it, God it, bless it, them. God bless them. If they can do right? it. Right. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> and I and I think that prompted from the stock market. You know, I think that. People are going to school and they're in the stock market and the stock market is going crazy. You're thinking, man, is this the right way to go? Like <laughs> you could be doing stock, but you know, the, I know. Look, the hey, dentistry, look. the dentistry is consistent. It's consistently yes. there. It's it's a need that everybody needs and it continues to be there, right? Yes. So, and I and if I could just add one, you know, this and that's a very good point when we you know we're talking about the financial aspect of dentistry. If you just do dentistry alone, you're not going to be the wealthiest guy in the world. Okay. You're not the well, you, you know. However, always put aside, I always saved, I remember my dad told me to always put aside a little bit each day. And I think that, you know, there's a rule with double, uh, w, uh, w, listen to me, of doubling. What is it, every seven double years? Down. Yeah, every seven or every 10 years, something like that. It does double. So if you start putting away and start saving an early life uh, in your professional career, uh, as you mature and get down the road somewhere, you're going to be able to be financially independent uh, when you're ready to retire whenever you want to do that so i think that's very important uh, 
always put a little, always start saving early. Don't spend right away. I know some kids get out of school where they want to have the biggest car uh, that they can get, the fastest car, etc. Okay, so you know, don't don't incur a bigger debt. Just just try and save a little bit. And and I think having the right wisdom of having the financial advisors, appropriate financial advisors, to give you advice to basically help you with tax strategy, with te- with yes, with, absolutely, with, with, with savings, with uh, planning out for the future, and having those resources is really important. Uh, I do that today. You know. We have a financial. Uh, I won't, uh, you know, I'm not making any, so I don't want to make any commercials or anything, but uh, um, <clears throat> so one of the large uh, mutual fund companies, uh, uh, I've always had vet invested with that for mutual funds. I didn't want to get any personal stocks. I didn't, I didn't know how to do that, but I felt that it would be a little safer with the mutual fund fund companies. And about probably about five years ago, uh, four or five years ago, we decided uh, to go with one of their personal advisors financial advisors. And uh, it really was a fantastic thing. And uh, with the recent bump that we've had, you know, it's affected uh, people all over at all levels and it's, fa- it's affected us as well. Uh, but we've been, but we were able to not really worry that the whole world was going to fall up- upon us, uh, fall down on us. Uh, and then we'd have nothing left to, uh, we'd have to be just strictly Medicare supporting us. So uh, we've been been successful that way. So I would have, I think that's a very good point that you said, you need a good financial advisor, someone that you feel that you can trust and someone that you can uh, take their advice and listen to them. Yeah, that's very important. How, how, how did you disassociate yourself from the stresses that we deal with in dentistry? Because dentistry is very stressful. So is there anything that you did? Because you practiced for many years, right? Yes. So you know, you know, you know what I mean? There's a lot of things. Absolutely. Have, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Where so if you were to give some advice to a young dentist that's starting his career and he has to go through the all the ups and downs that we go through, <laughs> right? All the patients that you learn that are bad patients that are difficult and challenging to deal with, how did you disassociate with that? And what was your strategy on that, what do you think? Find that some activity that you really, that would give you a chance to not worry about the office or about the practice or about the income that you really enjoy. For me at that time was uh, bicycling, uh, uh, the, uh, the thin tires, okay, the, uh, the, the street bikes. Uh, and I had a couple friends that were also dentists. And, you just like uh, wearing the outfit, right? Beg pardon? You just like wearing the outfit. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the whole bit, uh, there's the, uh, the uh, cleats. Uh, yeah. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You take a few tumbles and, you know, fell over, couldn't get the cleats out fast enough and uh, they tumbled over. But uh, we did uh, we did that and I enjoyed that. And it was very, removed a lot of the stress because when we, we would go from, God, from the valley, uh, from Woodland Hills area, we would cycle all the way over through one of the passes over to uh, Santa Monica. I mean, that was a big trip. That was probably yeah, about that's a, a long four trip. hour, yeah. three or four hour trip. And then uh, we'd come back again. And uh, so that was that That was one way to uh, really just get away from the office uh, and spend the whole day doing what you really want to do. Uh, I also love to work in the yard. I mean, my dad uh, taught me a lot about uh, I uh, put in my own sprinkler system uh, when we first started out in a very small home in Canoga Park. I put in the sprinkler system. I put in the yard. I, the, the lawn, I mean, I did everything. I always love working with my hands. I think that's one of the reasons I enjoy dentistry. My son, that's a uh, physician, he couldn't hit a nail with a hammer. and <laughs> But so God bless him. That he's a great physician. But I thought he'd make a great periodontist, but I'm so happy he didn't go into dentistry. So he's a great he's a great physician up in Santa Barbara. Beautiful, Very good. Dr. Very Berger. Good. I have a couple of questions for, for you. You know, we uh, we already been talking about okay. uh, an hour, but a couple of things. Number one is <clears throat> uh, because you've been in the leadership uh, management for more than thirty decade. I mean, three decades. Sure, so you you have a lot of. Um, experience with leadership would you uh, what are the uh, quality of the a leader uh, so is supposed to be when when they want to be a leader of an organization would you uh, share some kind of um, you know uh, experience that you have like what type of quality like what experience what kind of uh, yeah how, how would you approach a, a leader you know a, a good leader what kind of quality does he have enjoy speaking before a group 
Okay, I think that's very important. Uh, that you know, that's really what a leader is. A leader may not know everything, but if he has the confidence to speak before a large group, then a large group will really uh, will really believe that that's the person. What he's saying is 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 the gospel. So I always enjoy talking. In the beginning, I was very reluctant to speak before a group, but okay, after I got into it uh, uh, as dental director. It was a responsibility. One of the things I had to go out and meet with large groups, uh, uh, different employers. Uh, <clears throat> why we should, why why our company would be a good choice for them uh, to uh, to sign up for as our uh, dental plan. And so I had to be able to be able to speak to them. I had to know what I was talking about. Uh, and so speaking is a very important uh, leadership quality. Um, truthfulness, honesty. Uh, will always uh, rise to uh, the, the the surface. Uh, it, so it, those, those things, I think, those are important qualities. S leadership would be being being a good speaker. Believe in what you say. Don't try to, you know, cover up something if things aren't the way they should be. You need to tell them why it's why what the options are. So you know, if you speak as with honesty, people will will believe in you and they will accept what you have to say. Um, you know, if they have questions, then they'll ask you. So I think that's important. Uh, and I think uh, if I could say also dressing appropriately, I mean, that's a big thing. Uh, at least in my, I wore a shirt and tie for how many years? At the, I mean, today we, we have the scrubs and everything because of uh, the, uh, uh, you know, infection control and things like that. But I always wore a shirt and tie. I always wanted to look professional. I, that was just it. I always wanted to look professional. And I wanted to be professional. And I wanted, I wanted, I wanted to I like people, and I wanted people to also trust and like me. Uh, absolutely, I agree. Uh, Dr. Berger, another question that is I want to ask is the um, the future of dentistry. Do you see that uh, the are we going to go toward private practice or DSO uh, corporation? Uh, how would you say about um, what do you see the the, the future of? Boy, that's that's a that. I think that private dentistry still is the best way to go. Okay, and one of the speak one of the people at this I Love Dentistry made a really good comment. Okay, that um, you know a lot of young dentists are are, are afraid that you know that, that they may lose patients uh, to someone else because they're signing up uh, to one of the dental HMOs or the dental service groups. Um, and I think this is and then I can talk from from two levels. Patients today are very mobile, okay? They're not gonna stay in one place. Mm -hmm. So if you have a good relation with that patient or those patients, they will come back to you no matter where you're at. Now, I think a good example is myself. We're down here in Palm Desert, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, our physicians, uh, we have a great healthcare center down here at the Eisenhower Health Center, but it's, sometimes it's very difficult to find full-time physicians because because it's more of a uh, like during the snowbird times during the winter we get a lot of people coming down here when it gets a little warm and hot they all go back to wherever they came from canada or the midwest and a lot of the physicians also go back to where they work so it's not like it's, it's a lot of part-time so we establish physicians that we work with up in cedar sinai and up in up in mission viejo and we travel we don't mind traveling two hours up and two hours back and spend, it's actually, it's a full day traveling up there to see our physician. So my wife works out the schedule so we can see two or three of the people we wanna see up there, including the dentist. And we sometimes we'll stay overnight. Um, I don't like to drive that much anymore. So we have a driver that'll take us up and he'll stay overnight. And we've got very, very friendly with him and uh, he'll drive us to like three, two, two or three different offices. So we don't mind traveling. So that's what I'm trying to say. Patients that have confidence will come back to you, even though they move out of the area. Okay, because today people, I don't, I don't have any statistics, but you know, maybe five, ten years, they pick up and they want to go to another place to live, or they want to move to a different location. But they'll come back to you because they really trust you. Hey, Dr. Locke or Dr. Drury really took care of that tooth, and I'm going to go back to him. I don't want to have to find somebody that I don't know about. I like Dr. Drury or I like Dr. Locke. I want to go back and get my dental checkup with them. Whatever I need to get done, he'll take care of me. 
So I, I'm really kind of, hey, I'm lucky I've got those doctors so I can go back to them. So, I, so then I only have to worry about something else. I don't have to worry about my dental health. What if, if uh, in all the years, you probably read a lot of books, correct? You probably were all pretty versed in, in literature and reading books. They, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. You probably read a lot of books over the years, correct? Yes. Uh, someone that likes education generally likes to read books. If you had to pick a book, what is your favorite book? Uh, name an author. Wow. Okay. You, <laughs> there's a couple of them. Okay. I belong to audible.com. Audible. I don't know if you're familiar with Audible. Yeah, of course I am. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I love them. So I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a history buff. I'm a World War II buff. Uh, I just finished one that was one of the most ins inspirational books I ever heard. He was a um, Air Force uh, fighter pilot in World War II. Uh, his name was Olds, Robin Olds, R-O-B-I-N, and last name Olds, O-L-D-S. Uh, that was the most, he, 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 was a, he was a World War II ace, stayed in the Air Force. He wanted to get involved with the Korean War, but he was, with, he was in Washington uh, at the Pentagon and they wouldn't release him. He got involved with the uh, Vietnam War at age 40, over 40. He was head of the fighter squadron. He took this squadron that was really had poor uh, merits, built it up into confidence to the, to the top uh, fighter squadron in Vietnam for the U.S. Air Force. Went back to Washington again. He was a full bird. He bucked the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the War Department, the Air Force um, generals back in the Pentagon, who now believe that the fighter pilots were a thing of the past and that, uh, that the space and, 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 uh, and space and rocketry, that was going to be the thing, that um, aircraft with guns no longer were important. And he bucked them and he fought with them and he continued to do that to, to go forward. It was a really very inspirational um, that was a great book I read. Uh, it was a really fantastic. And I've read a couple other ones. Uh, Is there anything I, personal, a personal book that you learn personal lessons of perseverance or anything like that or leadership? And is there a business, a business book that helped you a lot with dental practice, like um, specifically that you think that was a business? No, I don't program? think I, I, none that I can recall, none that I can recall, be quite truthful. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of any, not offhand. I, I wish I probably made it, might have come across some of them. Uh, short books but i just can't think of anything right offhand no most problem. of it was most of it was just learning uh by the skin of your uh your, the seat of your pants sure dr Berger, it, it was an honor to have a conversation with you okay uh, great Carlos, yeah. on the platform today as we speak in fact michael gal want to say hello to you Charlie, you know, uh, Dr. Berger worked with Michael Gauff before. Oh, he did. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Michael and I, yeah, old deep, world, you know, we are deep, together. Deep level conversations. So yes, uh, he's 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 had some interesting uh, company experiences, right? Going through as far as dentistry, you know, even the first. Actually, I was wondering as he was talking, I was wondering if you knew him because, you know, he started some of the very first insurance related things, and so that's Wait, who I'm was his, who was it? Michael Ga Michael Michael Ga uh, Gal Gal Gold. Is it Michael? Oh, I know Michael. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was he, he he was with the company we started, Oral Health Services. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was wondering because he told so, me he started some of the very first organizations. Yes, yes, we so were a group of five he, dentists. We were a group he, of five dentists he, in, the, he, uh, in, he, he in the San me, Fernando Valley. He texted me and he said, uh, "I tried to uh, uh, bring uh, Dr. Berger to my show together, but now yeah. uh, you know uh, we, we we are in, but uh, he couldn't make it. But uh, it's, it's an honor." To have you and yeah, I know Robert Mike Gould, the, yeah, yeah. He, on, on, uh, we brought him on board, yeah, yeah. It he wonderful. became the CEO. Yeah, absolutely. Michael, want to say hello to you. So, uh, okay, we would love to see this podcast. But uh, okay, tell we can't Mike wait hello. to do another one next uh, next time with Michael. Okay, yeah, I'm seeing Mike. I I, I keep in contact with Mike. He's in uh, Midwest. I can't think where he's. He freezes over there, but his daughter's there. So that's where they love it. Yeah, he's he, he very active still. Anyway, yeah, still, still doing karate care. and stuff. Yeah, Doctor Berger, good to see you today. Okay, on good. Podcast. Right. Okay, thank pleasure. you. Honor, 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 and a privilege, Doctor Berger. Thank you uh, so same much here. for your thank contribution you, gentlemen. and uh, educating uh, people. You know that are starting out and and uh, their path, and maybe you know some of the things you said might have influenced their sphere of uh, understanding of where they're going to go. I think that's 
uh, very honorable contribution. So dentistry is a great profession. I think it's the greatest profession. I, and if I could just say one quick thing, I also belong to this group called NEPRIS, N-E-P-R-I-S, where uh, you can speak uh, like we're doing right now, Zooming uh, with uh, young uh, from anywhere from third graders up to 12th grade students, uh, whatever, so, you know, talk about dentistry and things of that nature. They, why, why should they be a dentist or what does a dentist do? And uh, they, or what it's an orthodontist and things like that. So I've done several presentations with that. So Beautiful. that also Wonderful. keeps me a little busy. So Wonderful. Thank you so much. Dr. Okay, Berger. bye guys. We can't wait to do it with you another time, okay? Okay, good. Take Sounds care. great. Take care. It's enjoyable. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah, thank you.